stragglers coming in here. Are we going? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, hi. <laughs> Welcome to our monthly cooking class. I'm Erica Beatty. I'm the registered dietitian here. And today's class, we are talking all about squash. Okay? So today's the season for squash. We're getting more in season. And I personally like to cook in season because it's less expensive and you reap the benefits of the foods that you're eating more so. For example, you're gonna get a lot more out of strawberries in June than you are in January, okay? So when you eat in season and uh, eat locally and things that are available in your region, you can reduce your food miles and likely improve your nutrition in a lot of ways. So today, how many of you like squash? Okay, that's good. I was gonna try and convert people to like squash if anyone didn't, but it looks like most people do. That's good it's news. Okay, I'm say. It's okay. Okay, well, I'm hoping I can make a couple recipes today that will help you guys branch out and try, broaden your squash horizons. How many of you have tried butternut squash? Okay, so most people have tried it. How about spaghetti squash? Okay, yes, good. How about acorn squash? Yep, zucchini wow. squash? Okay, good. So we're using all of those today except for the acorns. We're gonna use, do a butternut squash recipe, a spaghetti squash recipe, and a zucchini squash recipe. Okay, so kind of a wide variety there. We're gonna get started on the butternut one because that one takes the longest. Um, so what I'm making is a curried butternut squash soup. And it's really <coughs> quite tasty. What I'm doing now is just slicing the, the onion that's going to go into it. Hello, good morning. Come on and grab a seat. If you missed my little intro, we're talking about squash today. So we're making some squash recipes. We're getting started with a butternut squash soup that uses curry paste and some of those um, flavors as our base. Okay, and so is it red curry paste? Mm -hmm. Alright, I have yeah. some at home. <laughs> yeah. So I'm slicing this onion, and the reason why I'm not chopping it or mincing it smaller is because our soup is going to end up pureed. So it really doesn't matter. Okay, so I don't have to worry about mincing it or chopping it perfectly. I'm heating up some olive oil right now. Um, I wait until the olive oil gets warm or hot and I can hear the sizzle when it goes in. I just dropped a little piece of onion in there and I didn't hear anything. So I'm gonna wait till it gets a little bit warmer. Mm. Starts warming up a little bit. Okay. So the basis of flavor in our soup today kind of comes from our red curry paste. Now, here it is. So, hello, good morning. Sorry, we have this back here. Okay. So we're making, right now, we're working on our butternut curry squash soup. So that's what we're making as our first recipe. I'm heating up my olive oil right now and I just chopped an onion. Um, I wanted to show you guys, how many of you have cooked with this before? That looks familiar, a couple of you, okay. So this is actually used in a lot of like um, Asian type of dishes. And the reason I like this it's a great shortcut. You'll see some recipes that call for, for turmeric and ginger and cayenne and Thai red chilies and um, kind of this longer ingredient list. This has all of that in there in a convenient little paste. So you only have to buy this one ingredient and it adds all of that really good flavor into your dish. You can find this at any supermarket in the Asian foods aisle. Um, yeah, and it's right there but kind of by all the rice noodles and the coconut milk and you'll find these little things. This Thai kitchen is usually the, um, the brand that I find at most grocery stores. Okay, now you can kind of hear that oil sizzle. So I'm going to drop my onions in and begin sauteing those. Soften them up just a little bit. We kind of want to build our layers of flavor. So we've got our onions. I'm also going to add some garlic. Okay, and the the heat, my heat source is probably a little bit different from an oven that you would have at home. I would recommend cooking this on like medium to medium high, especially because you, you just want to soften the onions and garlic, you don't want to burn it. And garlic burns really pretty easily. So, I'm just going to get that going while we mince our garlic. 
So start right here. I have a couple of cloves of garlic here, so that I just peeled. And if I didn't show you my peeling method, okay, so I always recommend buying the whole head of garlic, not that pre-minced stuff. This is a lot fresher, a lot better flavor. Okay, it's a little more work, but it's worth it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just cut off the root end here, and then give it a smash with my knife. And then the peel comes off really easily. You know, you don't have to like go at it and try and get that peel off if you just like um, smash it a little bit. Again, with the, um, the garlic, I'm not gonna worry about it being like minced like super fine again because this is gonna be a puree soup. So we don't have to worry about, you know, like getting those perfect little pieces because it's not like you're gonna taste a huge chunk of garlic. You're, we're gonna puree it all together. Whoops. Okay. So I'm just gonna kind of give that a slice. And if you've been a long time comer of my class, you have heard my knife spiel. But if you want to hold a knife correctly, you hold it not here. Okay, you actually hold it on the hilt right here with your forefinger and your thumb on the blade and the rest of your hand on the handle. That way you have more control over the blade as you slice or as you chop. The knife really should never, whoops, <laughs> should never leave um, the cutting board at any time. You're kind of just guiding the food through with curled fingers on the other side. So my garlic is sliced. I'm just gonna go ahead and add it in there, just roughly chopped. You could also use a garlic press. But sometimes I feel like garlic press just isn't really necessary when you can just chop it up. Okay. We're gonna soften that up. We're gonna add just a little bit of flavor by adding salt and pepper. And again, my whole spiel about salt is that when you cook from scratch, it's okay to use a little bit of salt. Um, it's when you use a lot of processed foods that has a lot of salt added, but there's nothing wrong with a little salt when you're cooking something from scratch, right? So season that up with a little bit. I use kosher salt. <laughs> Not because it's better, not because it's less sodium, um, just because it's a little bit bigger of granules and I find that it has stronger flavor so you can use less for more flavor. Same thing, sometimes I get some sea salt. Again, not because it's less sodium, just because I like the flavor of it. Okay, those are getting nice and soft and caramelized. Gonna add a, lot, a little bit of pepper. And then we're gonna add our um, our Thai curry paste, okay? And once again, we don't need a lot of those other spices because that's all in here. You can kind of read, you know, red chili pepper, lemongrass, galangal, which is Thai ginger. There's a lot of good stuff right in this little paste. Woo, you can smell that pepper, can you? Okay. So I'm just gonna use probably about two heaping tablespoons of this based on your spiciness level. Now this is gonna give it a little bit of kick, but it's not gonna be like so spicy that you can't eat it, essentially. And you can already kind of smell that. Woo so, this is what I've got going on right now, okay? I'm just like sauteing it up with all those spices in there, the onion, okay? Just kind of getting it coated. When you put things over heat, it kind of brings out their natural oils and their natural flavor. So giving it a saute, like if you were to add the red curry paste to liquid, it wouldn't have near the amount of flavor as you would sauteing it first before adding the liquid. Okay, so we're giving that a good saute and then we're gonna add our butternut squash. This is one butternut squash that I just peeled and cubed. Okay, we're gonna add that in and get it coated with our flavor here. Smells good. Coughing from the <laughs> it's spice. I know. I could from that pepper. I was like, whoa, hello. Don't worry. It won't necessarily taste as <laughs> pungent as it smells. Although it does smell really good. Okay, so I'm just coating my butternut squash cubes with all the goodness in here. 
Okay. Mm, so good. And then what we're going to do is I'm just going to pour my vegetable broth over, bring it to a boil, and that's going to soften the butternut squash enough so that we're able to puree it. Okay. So. Um, and I usually get the organic low sodium. This one doesn't look like it's low sodium, but when I buy vegetable broth, I buy the low sodium just so that I can have more control over the salt level. Okay, so I'm just going to pour that over. And then I'm going to crank my heat because this little poor little hot plate doesn't get too hot. So hopefully we'll be able to cook our squash in time. And then I'm going to puree and add the final touch of um, adding a can of coconut milk. Okay, so this is the coconut milk I buy. That's going to reinforce kind of our Asian theme that we've got going on. It's going to kind of help mellow the flavor a little bit and give it a, lo a level of creaminess. So it's really tasty with the coconut milk. That. Okay, so we just want our liquid to cover our cubes of butternut squash. I'm going to cover it with the top of this pot and let that cook while we talk about our next recipe. Okay, so. Okay, cool. Okay, so the next recipe that we're going to do, oh, actually I just wanted to show you, this is the coconut milk that I'm gonna be using. It's from Trader Joe's. I say that if you want the best price on coconut milk, Trader Joe's is the place to go. Usually coconut milk can run like, like $3 a can. It's like $1.50 at Trader Joe's, so almost half the price. And, and it is organic, so um, I do recommend buying it there if you can, okay? Okay, so next up is spaghetti squash. Let me grab a skillet real quick. Forgot to grab it at the beginning. <laughs> Any questions on that recipe so far? No? So what size of butternut squash did you use? Small, medium, large? It actually was a rather small squash. Um, yeah, it was probably like that big. squash recipe and um, I just kind of wanted to show you so here's my spaghetti squash unfortunately I had to cook it before I came here because I don't have an oven here and you do usually need to cook spaghetti squash either in a slow cooker a pressure cooker or in the oven um, so this is what a spaghetti squash looks like it looks like this when you buy it obviously okay it's like this big yellow thing mm -hmm. okay and what you want to do is just cut it open gonna have like that pulp and the seeds in there like a pumpkin would and you're gonna scrape that part out and then my favorite way to cook a spaghetti squash is just to drizzle it with a little bit of olive oil sprinkle it with salt and pepper you can kind of see the pepper still on there and then place it in a casserole dish okay place it face down okay not face up face down 400 degree oven for about 30 minutes okay and some people say to put water in the pan. Um, I actually feel like that makes the, the spaghetti squash quite soggy. Um, maybe if it starts to scorch on the bottom, a splash of water just to steam it and prevent the scorching. But I wouldn't put a layer of water like a lot of recipes recommend just because it does make it rather squashy, squishy. Squishy, squashy, soggy. Okay, so this is kind of the texture that you're looking for when it's done. You want it to be cooked, but you don't want it to be overcooked, okay, because it does end up pretty soggy. So, um, what you do is just take a fork and it kind of just forks away like this and it ends up looking like spaghetti noodles. And this is a really fabulous, more nutritious way to enjoy. I mean, it's not even pasta, but if you use it kind of in place of some of the pasta or maybe half spaghetti squash, half noodles, that can be a good way to add nutrition. Squash is really high in vitamins, nutrients, and antioxidants, um, and a good way to maybe kind of help cut down on the starchiness or the carbs that are in your regular dish, um, and not to mention calories. Spaghetti squash is a 
fraction of the calories that regular pasta would be. And so this is a really good way to kind of healthify your, your common recipes a little bit. Also, spaghetti squash is super versatile. So today we're doing just, you know, a basic kind of like veggie saute in with our um, spaghetti, spaghetti squash, but you could use like your typical marinara sauce on top of it. You could toss it with pesto, okay? Pesto and chicken or um, pesto and shrimp or something like that. You could even just make it simply like this and just have it as a side dish with other things that you have going on in your meal. Okay, like if you had a protein and a salad and then your spaghetti squash was kind of like your starchy side, but it's not very starchy. So basically what you wanna do is just kind of get all of the flesh out of here that you can. And one spaghetti squash goes a really long way, which is great. Um, it, if it's cooked right, it'll, it'll keep pretty well, but if you overcook it, the, uh, the leftovers will probably not be great. Or if you combine it with really watery things in your dish, um, you might want to try and make that for a crowd or eat it all in one go because the leftovers sometimes aren't that fabulous. What about using avocado oil instead of extra virgin olive oil when you, you drizzle it before you turn it upside down? Yeah, that could work. Yeah, avocado oil is um, a good choice, especially when you cook things at, I mean, 400 is not that high of heat, but when you cook things at a higher heat, avocado oil can be a good um, alternative for sure. That's going to be still really high in the unsaturated fats that we love olive oil for. Um, which is more considered more kind of like the heart healthy types of fats. And avocado oil usually isn't as processed as and refined as things like vegetable oil. And you know, I mean, vegetable oil is not terrible, but I do say try and choose more unrefined vegetable oils like avocado oil or walnut oil if you do go that route. Even sunflower oil, if you get it um, like the, the less processed kind is better. Okay, this actually yields like a ton of spaghetti squash. I was actually kind of worried. I was like, will one spaghetti squash be enough? But, but it does. It like yields like a lot of like noodles per se, which is pretty cool. Okay. Oh, that was perfect. Perfect. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> I do this a lot, you guys. No. <laughs> okay, so. Um, now I'm going to attempt to saute my vegetables to go in here. Um, I'm not sure how well that's going to work in given this situation. Let me check on this real quick. You need an electric skillet. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? I got one at uh, Goodwill, right new, and that's all I cook in. Nice. That actually is pretty cool, and probably good for like when it's hot and you don't want to like heat up the whole house with the oven and stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna set that aside. So basically my saute is just gonna be a little bit of tomatoes, olives, and basil, and garlic, and then we're gonna throw that in, and then along with a little bit of feta cheese. So it's really simple. Um, you can use it as a side dish. You know, I think it's satisfying even enough to be a main dish. Um, if you added a little bit of protein like chicken or shrimp or um, some white beans or garbanzo beans, I think it's like a really well-rounded meal. So, can you, okay. Can you freeze the um, spaghetti squash or is it comes out mushy? Yeah, it's so high in water that it doesn't freeze very well because when you thaw it, it gets really that kind of like mushy texture, unfortunately. Okay, so I'm gonna start heating my pan and heating my olive oil a little bit over here. I've just got some baby garden tomatoes um, that I just kind of have. You could just use like chopped tomatoes. You could even take a can of tomatoes and drain it and use the tomatoes from that, like if it was out of season. Tomatoes are in season right now though, so that's a good thing to use or have in hand. 
Um, I like this little serrated paring knife to use to cut tomatoes just because they have such a thin skin that when you use a knife like that, you can kind of smash the tomato before you've got it cut in half. Um, so if you have a little knife like this, it's kind of a handy tool for things like cutting limes, lemons, tomatoes, things with that um, outer rind. So I'm just cutting those in half. Um, this again is like a really versatile dish. You could use shallots, you could use onions, you could put some bell peppers and mushrooms, you know, really anything that you want. It's not, I mean, a recipe to follow to the T and that's kind of the joyful thing about cooking is that you can really make it however you like. Like if you don't like garlic, I don't know who doesn't like garlic, but, um, or if you don't like tomatoes, or if you don't like a certain ingredient, or if your diet restricts a certain ingredient, you can always swap it out for a different one, <coughs> which is kind of nice. Okay, so two things of garlic here. I'm gonna kind of just mince those up. This one I am gonna give a little bit better of a mince because we're not burying it, obviously. slice it one way and then go back and slice it the other way. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and check the temp of our stuff over here. I have a hard time getting this um, But luckily, this only really needs a quick saute. I mean, you could honestly add just like raw tomatoes in there and it would probably be really good. Um, but we're gonna give this a little bit more drizzle of olive oil over there and a sprinkle of salt and pepper. That's really all it needs as far as like dressing or seasoning. Sometimes I like to add a spoonful of pesto. Um, that gives it a nice something something, but otherwise I think it's just really good, just simple. Um, don't need a lot of ingredients to have like a well-balanced meal and not to mention like really inexpensive. I mean squash is extremely um, inexpensive. Pumpkin, sweet potato, acorn, spaghetti squash, <coughs> zucchini, all super inexpensive and a really good way to eat nutritiously but on a budget. Okay. Also I, if you, if you know me, you know I'm always a fan of like buying the whole ingredient and doing it yourself, like a whole block of cheese and grating it yourself, a whole head of garlic and mincing it yourself. Fresh cracked pepper, cracking it yourself, right, instead of the pre-made. That just adds that other layer of flavor that just kind of dissipates when things are pre-done, okay? So that's what I always recommend. Okay, so that's feeling hot. The more processed stuff is, um, you're losing vitamins, so if you can do it right. as much full as you can, right. you get more nutrition. Right, exactly. Okay. Give those a saute. And then... Okay, and this has like a little bit of a of a Greek vibe even because of the garlic and the olives and the uh, the feta, okay? If you wanted to make it even more of a kind of a Greek Mediterranean vibe, you could add artichoke hearts or uh, Kalamata olives or even, we're, today we're just using um, black pitted olives, just these ones. Um, hey, here's the exception to my rule. I can't stand buying the whole olives and slicing them myself. <laughs> so I buy the pre-sliced ones, which again, this this is an exception to my rule because there's really no difference between the whole black olive and the sliced black olive. So <laughs> I break my rule on that one. However, I do think the whole olives are probably a little bit less expensive. You get more, so you could save a little bit of money doing that way, but for convenience sake, I kind of just do the shortcut. So for my basil, I'm You're just, mainly picking off the leaves. Yeah, you know, you can use the stems, um, but it does, it, it interferes with the texture of the dish a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to be really good about not wasting, um, if you made pesto, you could throw the stems in there too. Or how about tying it with string and then pulling it out after the dish was done? 
Okay, yeah, yeah, you could totally do that. Or use it to make like a stock or something like that. Add the herbs and your other flavorings to make the stock. That's a great idea. Okay. So, I'm just gonna give these a little saute. Add the garlic after a minute. We don't wanna add the garlic too early because um, again, we don't want it to burn. However, I don't think that thing gets hot enough to burn it. So what I do, I basically just kind of pile up my leaves on top of each other. And then, these are kind of messy leaves, but then just kind of roll it like this. And then we're just gonna kind of cut through this way. And that's actually called a chiffonade, how we're cutting it right and it kind of makes the basil more into like ribbons um, that just kind of look pretty and are easily consumed. So that kind of ends up that nice cutting and it's not too hard. So that's kind of what you're going for when you chop basil. Okay, so we're actually not going to cook the basil. We're just going to add that in here, our fresh basil. And then the seasoning that I'm mainly using, um, kind of in the same vein as how the curry paste were all those Asian flavors together, um, in this more Italian style dish, I could use basil and oregano and thyme and sage and garlic powder, right? But instead, I choose to kind of go the easy route and I have this Italian um, seasoning that's all of those mixed in there together. And this can kind of save you money if you don't want to buy like every spice on the spice rack to just get some of these shortcuts that kind of have them all combined together. And yeah, I love just getting this Italian and just going crazy on certain dishes. <laughs> so, oh, it's not even open. Um, and again, with your spices, I say like buy, I mean, you can buy it in bulk, which is a really good way because you want to use up, use your spices up within a reasonable amount of time. I mean, I think I've told this story before. I recently went through my spice cupboard. There were spices in there from like 2008. And I was just like, what in the world? Like you do not want to be, well, I mean, it wouldn't harm you to use spices from 2008, but they're not going to have any flavor. They slowly lose their flavor over time. So you want to be sure to keep your spice rack up to date. And that's why buying in bulk just little amounts because you know, who's bought, bought what sumac or celery seed one time to make one thing and you used half a teaspoon and now it's been sitting in your cupboard for years and years. So sometimes buying in bulk can be a good way to go. So again, like I said, with getting some of those spices and those herbs on the heat, that really helps bring out the flavor. You can already smell it. You can already smell it more when it get, hits that heat and hits the oil. Um, sometimes what I like to do is rub it between my fingers because that helps bring out the oil too and the flavor of your dishes. So I'm gonna get that in there. I'm gonna get my garlic in there. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, she's like, give me some of that stuff. Yeah, and then I'll probably just season those tomatoes also with just a little bit of salt. Again, layering our flavors on instead of just seasoning at the end. You want to season as you go because you end up using less than when you taste it at the end and you're like, oh, I need some salt, and you just keep adding it on. Okay, a little bit of salt. 
So you're kind of like caramelizing the tomatoes, right? A little bit, yeah. You want them to just barely break down. When you overcook tomatoes, they become mush. But what you want is them to go just from raw, just to slightly caramelized and broke, broke down. <laughs> um, just softened a little bit is what, we, what we're going for. You still want to taste those big um, chunks of cooked tomato, right? We're not making a tomato sauce, per se. Okay, and I'm also going to add our olives in here. Of course, olives don't need to be cooked, but we're just going to warm them through a little bit with the rest of our saute. <coughs> and I just used like a little six ounce can of, um, of olives. I really love all kinds of olives. I think Kalamata olives would be great in this recipe, um, or even green olives or Spanish olives. But black <coughs> olives are great too. Oops. And olives are a really good source of healthy fat. Right, you've all probably heard they're technically a fruit, right? Um, um, but we kind of use them as a fat or a vegetable. They're kind of one of the more fatty fruit slash vegetable like avocado, right? Um, they're a little higher in calories than your typical vegetable. So they're actually healthy for you. They're very healthy for you. Yeah, extremely healthy for you. Those good types of fats, the monounsaturated fats. Don't eat them raw. What? Don't eat them raw. Don't eat them raw, they olives? They have to be processed. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I've never had the opportunity sick. to eat a raw olive, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, very, very sick. Would you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where'd you have to go to get them, Israel? No, they grow them in California. Really? Yeah. They, you probably have to have like the warmer weather. But yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, the Mediterranean is famous for olives. That's probably mm -hmm. where a lot of them are grown. Any questions so far? How are we feeling? Okay. I think spinach is also a great addition to this as well. If you just want to throw in, I'm constantly throwing in a handful of spinach to like everything I make. Oh, oh, spinach. You know, it's very versatile. You can add it to a lot of things, and it gives that nutrition boost. And it's loaded with magnesium, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. It has some iron, magnesium, a lot of vitamin A, chlorophyll. Good source of antioxidants. Okay. Um, we are also going to add some feta cheese. Um, this feta is actually kind of the flavored kind with Mediterranean herbs um, that I thought was kind of fun and fancy. Usually where you find feta, sometimes you don't find it in your regular like blocks of cheese aisle. If you go over to like the deli section, they have like those rounds, those islands. Usually that's usually where you would find feta, especially something more specialized like this kind. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this little toss in here. And kind of the unique thing, the feta will melt just a little bit because um, these are kind of warmer ingredients, but it'll also stay in chunks and be kind of that yummy, tangy flavor as well. Also, Feta and cheese in general is um, a little higher in sodium, so you want to be factor that into your salt, um, your seasoning of your dish for sure. Okay. Okay, that's looking just about right here. So you can kind of see like the tomato is like releasing its juices and it's really kind of soft. Um, and that's kind of what we're going for, but it's still clearly a whole tomato, you know, that you can um, taste and eat in your dish. I'm gonna check the seasoning. Tastes good. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and add that in to our spaghetti squash. And then you have 
this meal that's like all vegetables. And it doesn't like seem like all vegetables, but it is, which is kind of cool, which is the best way that I like to do things, you know? You don't want to just necessarily eat a bowl of like raw chopped vegetables as a meal, but when you make it something like this, it can be a lot tastier and a lot more satisfying in a lot of ways. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any questions on this? We're going to let this sit just for a little bit and then we're going to get to try it. Um, Sounds good. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so delicious. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. taste this. Mm -hmm. Tastes good. Okay. <coughs> cool. Can't wait for you guys to try it. Okay, the third recipe that we're going to do is using zucchini. And again, Unfortunately, I had to make this one before I came here because I don't have an oven. But I really wanted to show you guys my favorite zucchini muffin recipe. Look at how easy it is. Ta-da! <laughs> so let's see that. Okay, but I am going to kind of tell you some of the healthy baking substitutions I use when I'm baking um, and a couple tips and tricks for making muffins in general. The recipe's over here, so at least you'll go home with the recipe, right? Um, so, I usually um, make my recipes with a lot of zucchini. Like whatever it calls for, I use like a half a cup to a cup more than that because it adds more moisture, okay? And it's just better for you. The more zucchini, the better, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of like baked good <coughs> recipes obviously have a lot of sugar. They usually have a lot of fat. Um, they usually have refined white flour and some ingredients that maybe aren't the best to have on a regular basis. So how I made these muffins, okay? So I swapped the white flour out for whole wheat flour, okay? Um, and I kind of like to use whole wheat pastry flour Okay, and the only difference is that it is a ground up a little bit finer so that it's not necessarily as heavy and dense as whole wheat usually is. Pastry flour is just a little bit lighter, which makes it kind of good for muffins like this. So whole wheat pastry flour, you could also use something like almond flour, coconut flour, or a nut based type of flour. These are a little bit different because they don't have wheat and they don't have gluten. So it's a good gluten-free alternative, but you do have to adjust your leavener a little bit, like the baking soda or the baking powder, in order to get them to rise and have the same structure that non-gluten-free baked goods have, because of that gluten provides the structure. So for these ones, I used whole wheat. Instead of refined white sugar, I used 100% natural maple syrup, okay? Not Mrs. Butterworth's, not maple flavored syrup, like true 100% maple syrup. Okay, this is like, and that's like a natural sweetener, right? There's nothing else added. It's just maple syrup from a tree. You could also use something like honey or agave syrup. Keep in mind though, these still have sugar, okay? Maple syrup, honey, and agave, tablespoon per tablespoon, white sugar, honey, maple syrup, same amount of sugar, okay? So do still keep that in mind because um, although it's a lot less refined, it's still going to be quite a bit of sugar and something you should have in moderation. Still healthier than white sugar. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not refined for sure. Um, so yeah, I swapped that out for maple syrup and instead of like refined vegetable oil or butter, I used um, coconut oil. Okay. So coconut oil or even extra virgin olive oil is good in baked goods as an alternative to the refined vegetable oils. Um, coconut oil is even kind of a good replacement for butter because it's solid at room temperature so it kind of mimics that same texture as butter usually has. Um, so what I did is just had some um, organic coconut oil and you just melt it in the microwave and then you can use that in your baked goods as well. Yeah, so that's so those were kind of my three biggest substitutions was the coconut oil, the whole wheat pastry flour, and the maple syrup, okay? And then I doubled my zucchini, okay, to make that um, just packed with zucchini flavor. I also just tend to use a little bit less sweetener and a little bit less oil. 
So like if a recipe called, for example, one cup of oil, I might use half a cup, but then add something like half a cup of applesauce, which gives a lot of good moisture to things, um, but cuts down on the fat, okay? And that's the whole purpose of fat in baked goods recipes is to add moisture, okay? And to kind of, um, that texture, that crumb, and the, is the whole purpose of fat. So when you have completely fat-free baked goods, that's why they can end up a little bit drier and less tasteful, I guess. So using some oil, just not a whole lot of oil. This recipe only calls for a third of a cup, which I, I think is like a pretty decent amount of, you know, of oil. That's like a healthy for that amount of muffins. You only have a little bit of oil per muffin. I also use um, almond milk instead of regular milk. And actually, this recipe calls for buttermilk, okay? So a quick way if you don't have buttermilk on hand, like I just had plain unsweetened almond milk. You just add a couple teaspoons of um, white vinegar or lemon juice, okay? So for example, if you, for every like one cup of milk, you would add two teaspoons of acid either in the form of vinegar or lemon juice, which is exactly what I did this morning because I don't have buttermilk. And so I used plain almond milk with a little bit of white vinegar, okay? And you just let it sit for five minutes and that just sours the milk a little bit and makes it more reminiscent of buttermilk, which is great for cooking. It interacts with the leavening agent, the baking soda and the baking powder to help give a nice um, fluffy muffin, okay? Um, so a couple tips and tricks when you make muffins. Don't overmix them, okay? That is a common thing that people do. Mix, 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 okay? No, what you wanna do is mix your dry ingredients up, mix your wet ingredients up, then add them together and barely incorporate them together and then that's it, okay? When you mix your um, batter too much, it makes your muffins really dense and hard, okay? Um, but when it's just kind of barely mixed together, it makes them the texture and the crumb a little bit lighter and airier, okay? Another thing I say to do is I love, how many of you have those ice cream scoops that have like the scoop or outer thing in them? Okay, that's what I love to make muffins with because then you get a uniform amount every time you put it in. Like these are all relatively the same size, right? So when you um, scoop your batter into the thing and it has that relatively like same amount of batter in each one and don't overfill because they will spill over, okay? So about two thirds of the way full is how full you wanna fill your muffin tins. Okay, these were baked at 400 for about 15 minutes and you want the toothpick to just go in and come out clean. It's a little bit deceiving with fruit and vegetable baked goods because you might hit like a piece of fruit and it might look like it's wet when it's really not, okay? So make sure to check a couple different places because this might be cooked through, even though there's that juicy fruit or the you know zucchini in there. Okay, so any questions on like healthier baking? Um, did you add any applesauce rather than oil in this? Well, since it only called for a third a cup of oil, I just kept it the full third a cup because it's already kind of a healthy recipe. Right. But if I was like looking at a recipe that was maybe not so healthy and I wanted to adjust it, that's when I would maybe adjust it for the applesauce. Huh. Yeah. I used to work years ago at KFC and I had to do their buffet and I had more compliments with the muffins because I used the uh, ice cream. Yeah. Soup. Other people's were just flat. Mine, I found using a scoop, it makes them more round on the... More uniform, yeah, totally. <coughs> yeah, definitely. Any other questions or anything? We can kind of check on our butternut and see how those are going. Okay. squash to be cooked through. Ooh, good news, you guys. That feels cooked through for sure. Yay, I was worried. <laughs> okay, so I'll show you a piece of squash right here. I'm just going to take a piece of the butternut squash out. Oops. And what you want it to do is just easily cut through like that, right? That's definitely cooked. Okay, okay. so it kind of just crumbles apart, right? 
So that's what we're going for, which means that it will pretty easily be pureed. So I'm just gonna turn off the heat here and we're going to add our coconut milk, <coughs> okay? And then we're just gonna kind of puree it all together. Can this be frozen too? This definitely can be frozen, for sure. You know, I think soups are great to make like a bigger batch of this and then to and freeze individual portions to have like on nights where you don't feel like cooking. Okay. Awesome autumn recipe. You right? Autumn winter, yeah. Oh. So good. Okay. Pour that in there. And when you freeze your soup, what kind of container do you do? Put it in Ziploc or do you prefer glass? Ziploc definitely works. Um, and, and I do recommend glass. Glass is easy to use and just put it in your microwave. blended up together now and it's like this beautiful orange glossy smells delicious creamy soup and not an ounce of dairy y'all super creamy soup without dairy I love it okay so we got that all blended together this is called an immersion blender okay so easy for making soups and things like that you can get this anywhere Walmart uh, Target um, Bed Bath and Beyond. I think maybe like twenty or thirty dollars. Yeah, they're not bad. I mean, it's kind of just like a handy little tool. Use a blender too. Absolutely. I was gonna say like if you didn't, like you could easily just transfer this to a blender or a food processor and blend it up that way. This is so easy to look. All you have to do is rinse that off. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's so easy. Yeah, so. Okay, one more little blitz right there. Okay. Oh, what's that thing called again? It's called an immersion blender. It's also sometimes just called a hand blender. Okay. Yeah. You know, Amazon probably would have a really good price too if you just looked on Amazon. Okay, so last kind of finishing touch on that. I'm just going to squeeze the juice of a lime in. Okay, give it that nice pop of citrus at the end. And then I like to serve this with like peanuts on top or you could even do fresh herbs like scallions or mint or uh, cilantro. And that kind of gives, I actually was meaning to drink cilantro and mint and then I forgot. But, <laughs> but it would be a really good addition on there. So just the juice of a lime. If you ever have any vegetarian or vegan friends, this is definitely a great recipe to make for them. Because just pair this with like a nice hunk of whole grain bread and a salad and you have a really good, like easy vegetarian meal. That's like really satisfying. So. Wow, that, that machine, that thing really squeezes the It really out squeezes the little juice out, huh? I know. Yeah. It's kind of handy, I like that for sure. Okay, last thing to do is just kind of taste for seasoning. Make sure that it's seasoned well. Tastes good, y'all. Doesn't even need salt and pepper or anything. It's just ready to go because you kind of seasoned those flavors as you were going. Okay, yeah, Karen. Uh, I have a slow cooker, so can we do slow cooker on that? Absolutely. So what you would do is just add those main ingredients that I just did beforehand, like the vegetable broth, the onions, the red paste, and the butternut squash. Let that cook, and then after the butternut squash is cooked, then add your coconut milk and in, immerse. In yeah, immersion blend. Yep. Absolutely. That's a really easy way. Um, instant pot would be a good way to do this as well. Who? What? Instant pot? 
Have you always oh heard of the Instant God, Pot? No. An Instant Pot, it's all the rage right now, y'all. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's basically a pressure cooker. Have you guys heard of a, uh, know what a pressure cooker is? It's like, honestly, one time I had a spaghetti squash, I just stuffed my spaghetti squash in the pressure cooker and cooked it. It was done in five minutes. Okay, you can take a frozen chicken breast, throw it in there, 10 minutes cook through from frozen all the way cooked. So it's basically a really, really, really high pressure, high heat cooking system that can cook things that normally take a long time like dried black beans or spaghetti squash or you know some of those things and cook them really quick. Like you could cook like a whole pork roast in an hour. Like a huge one. That's what my daughter yeah. did. She mm. put potatoes or carrots, right. all that. It's called what? It's called an instant pot. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're pretty handy. Um, I'm excited to use mine more. So, uh, instant pots are really good for like soups and meats and things like that, which I'm not into as much during the summer. And then during the fall, you kind of get more into those recipes. So, Can you it. any work? Um, yeah, I ordered mine on Amazon, but I'm sure you could find deals at Macy's, Bed Bath & Beyond, at Walmart. Walmart, exactly, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty popular right now. I feel like you could probably find them at a lot of places. I just promised it for my birthday. My birthday has been here and gone. Oh, no! <laughs> so I'm having my son-in-law. I'm That's too good. Yeah. You can find um, pressure cookers or instant pots for people that And pressure cookers are good for canning too. You can also make yogurt in them. You can hard boil eggs in them. They're my daughter they're does pretty cool. boiled eggs and yeah. hers. Yeah, it's way cool. Hmm. Okay, well you guys, I'm super excited for you to try all this squash. So I have some, like just, uh, I don't think I have enough bowls for everyone, but there's some cups um, over here that you could use if we run out of